Golan 73, a game by GMT, the third game in the fast action battle system. Uh, previous games in the system were Sicily and The Bulge. I played both, I enjoyed both, especially Sicily, both because by then uh, I already knew the system so I didn't have to go through the work of learning it. It's a pretty innovative system when I encountered it first in The Bulge, I was a little confused. And also enjoyed it, I enjoyed Sicily simply because the map makes the action very interesting because uh, things happen all over the place, it's not just a single front moving back and forth. Golan 73 is the first time that the system is applied to a post World War II uh, topic. The game is about the Yom Kippur War, we are on the Golan Heights and Syria is attacking Israel and Israel is trying to hold the line and to pull, and to bring in reinforcements to stop the advance of the enemy and possibly to start pushing back. Let's have a look at the game, let's see how the system is implemented in this new title. The board for the game, which you see here, is printed on thick cardstock of very good quality. It lays flat on the table quite well. I didn't need to use plexiglass to play the game. The map is divided in areas, not hexes as you can see. There is a net of roads that will facilitate movement. Various types of border that have different effects and really there are more difficult borders than in other games in the system. You have wadis, you have escarpments, all things that are going to be problematic for the Syrian player because it is the Syrian player that is trying to make haste and to travel uh, as fast as possible to conquer objectives before the Israeli player uh, is able to bring in many reinforcements. Here, very important, we have the border between Israel and Syria. If you're playing the historical scenario around this area and this strip of areas here, you will find most of the units that are placed on the board at the beginning of the game during setup. And they will already be units belonging to both players. That is, the historical scenario starts right after the Syrian player has invaded, so there will be already areas on the board containing units of both players. Uh, and for that reason, the first turn starts with a combat phase. If you are playing a variable scenario, a scenario with variable setup, then there's more flexibility. The players can set up differently, but um, it's good to have the historical scenario. I always like to start from the historical scenario, but you can have more replay value if you want to try different strategies, different uh, opening moves. Now that we're looking at the map more up close, you can see that areas have numbers that identify them for setup purposes. Also, different shapes and colors around the number of the area that indicates the type of terrain and in particular the defensive quality of that type of terrain. And also you have symbols such as this one indicating areas that score victory points to the players that occupy them. Some areas only score uh, victory points for the Israeli players, some other ones only only for the Syrian player and some areas for whichever player controls them. Now, uh, as other fast action battles uh, games, here we have two types of resources that the players will control. Units and assets. Units are represented by blocks, so this is a block game and usually blocks will be facing the owning player so that the opponent only sees the back and then the units will be re revealed during combat when contact is made and combat initiated. However, uh, it is also possible to play the game solitaire with the blocks face up. Yes, you lose the fog of war, but in this game you do not have many units, not like in other cases. Uh, the possibilities of incredible ambushes based on you not realizing when the opponent has, where the opponent has placed certain pieces are not that great, so you don't really lose that much. If the dilemma for you is uh, to play it with the uh, blocks face up solo or not play it at all, go solo because it is perfectly playable that way. Now units have a number of combat points, health points, uh, I don't remember what the technical name is. It is that units that measure that when it goes to zero the unit goes, goes kaboom. And the block will be standing, showing on the 
on top the current number of hit points, health points that it has. So if the block is standing like that, this unit has four points. If the unit takes a hit, you record that by rotating that. If the unit recovers, then you rotate it the other direction. And of course, if you're playing solo, then you simply need to keep things consistent uh, with the blocks laying down face up. You may have noticed that the strength points that the units have are a different color. They may be white representing green units, uh, black representing elite uh, veterans, and red representing elite. So the worst, sort of middle of the road, the best. And as you can see here, and it's something that I really like in this game, the level of experience changes. When an elite unit takes hits, so that he gets a little demoralized and he starts acting like a veteran, loses their elite edge. On the other hand, you have green units that may get reduced because they take hits, but in the meanwhile, they figure out a thing or two about the job, and so now they don't count as green anymore. And of course, you also have pieces that do not have this changing color, but uh, most do, and I something that I really like because block games, uh, uh, like you can see here, manage to factor in a lot of information, a very simple, elegant system that allows you to keep track of all the information in a very easy and intuitive way. So as I said, units represented by blocks, and then we have assets, which really are what gives uh, uh, games in the system a, a pretty unique flavor. Assets are represented by counters, not by blocks, and they can be used in a variety of ways. There is a huge number of them and a large variety. Engineers, infantry, armor replacements, uh, anti enter aircraft defenses that the Syrian player has, air support, uh, it was here, I, I lost the air support, I guess it flew away, air support, lots of different things, and this is, this is far from all the ones that are, all the ones that are available, we have strong points, etc, 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 artillery, super very important, so what happens, uh, what happens is that these, uh, Assets can be committed to battle and can be spent in other situations to perform special actions. Engineer units, for example, can perform a variety of things, such as, for example, blowing up bridges or or removing minefields. They can also be used for fighting. Uh, artillery is used clearly to support combat. A lot of different things. Uh, of course, there are conditions for you to be able to use the assets. The situation must apply so that you can use a certain asset. You need to be able to uh, have to uh, have supply to the area where you want to use them that abstracts the fact that you are moving them there although you do not move the assets physically on the board you simply place them where you need them if again you have a supply line to the area where you want to use an asset now a uh, sequence of play at the beginning of return, both players may receive reinforcements may, and will receive also new assets that will be drawn from a selection cup, which is a cup where you place them, and that determines a random order in which you will receive your assets. Then player one will perform operational movement, so you simply move up to the number of movement points that you have. Infantry has three movement points, mechanized units have six, and the cost is based on the type and number of borders that you are crossing, with certain borders being particularly challenging and having restrictions about the number of units that can cross a certain, a certain border. So, movement of first player, player one, uh, player one can also place units in reserve. Uh, then strategic movements may occur, which uh, allows to move units a little further. And then you have uh, you have combat after the movement of player one has been resolved. Player one resolves combat, and in that phase, in that situation, player one counts as the as the attacker. Uh, if you just uh, uh, entered an area, you just turned a non-contested area in a contested one, then combat is mandatory, otherwise it is as desired by the players. And to resolve combat, you go through several steps, which at the beginning may seem a little complicated, seem a little, you know, 
fiddly, but in truth, they make sense. They're very logical. Also, you have this truly excellent player aid here with the sequence of play on one side. And in case you want more detail, then you have the extended sequence on play. All that you wanted to know about the sequence on play, but you were afraid of asking. Also, movement table. And as we are to it, there's also another player aid, which is equally excellent. Uh, on one hand, on one side, you have the actual matrix telling you what the units can do and when, in which phase of each turn, event summary, and then tables that are used to resolve combat, basically combat tables and various other things, such as the moral table or the disorder unsupplied um, reminder of what those effects do. We were talking about combat, we'll use this to make sure we don't forget any any uh, step. The defender may take a special action, such as reinforcing or retreating, then the attacker, then the defender will commit assets, and there are limitations as to the assets that you can commit, uh, based on whether or not you're using units belonging to the same echelon, if not, then you can only use a reduced number of assets Assets, assets may allow you to perform special actions, uh, for example, their support you can use to add uh, strength points to the combat or to give dice modifiers, to give a positive modifier to your die rolls. Uh, artillery will simply fire and will fire early during combat. So after you, after assets have been committed, each player will uh, also declare a point unit, which is the unit that will take the first hit that a unit must take. It is possible that other things in the battlefield will take hits before the point unit has to get a dent, but if a unit does take a hit, then the point unit must be the first one to do so. Finally, really units, and then you have artillery fire from the attacker and then the defender, and then ground fire uh, from the defender and then the attacker. See this nice thing here. The attacker, yes, gets the surprise of the first artillery fire. The defender doesn't take long to react, but the defender gets the first, um, the first attack in the in the ground fire. And these attacks are not simultaneous, so each time you get to fire with whatever points uh, have survived from the uh, previous phase. Also, when all is said and done, uh, there may be situations that will allow you, uh, that may allow you to perform breakthrough movement and even breakthrough combat. Then you check supply and you're good to go. Now, as for combat itself, the basic idea, the key idea is that you roll dice, you roll dice, say number of dice equal to the number of points that are firing, uh, whether that is artillery, artillery dice that are firing, uh, the artillery dice, such as that one, or this guy. So artillery or regular uh, strand points during ground combat, you roll a number of dice equal to that, to the number of points that are firing. The success number, the basic hit number, is always five. And you have these nice dice that are 10 sided, and yes, they have a 10, so you don't have to wonder. The end of the game, wait a second, does zero mean zero or 10? Zero should always mean zero, and 10 should be represented by a 10. Well done, GMT, to give us dice that make sense. The basic success number in the game is five. You roll five or more, hooray, you were successful at doing whatever it is that you were trying to do, in this case, to hit the opponent. However, guess what? Modifiers, alas, modifiers. So you roll those dice and then you have to go through a fairly long list of modifiers that will be a little daunting at the beginning for new players. But again, the advantage is that it really makes sense. Um, after a while, it becomes second nature. Look at the situation, you'll get a good sense. So you'll get a plus two, minus three. Then you double check one or two things you may have forgotten. But it won't be all that hard. It will take less than you imagine to learn all the modifiers that apply. And really, creating situations that exploit the right set of modifiers is a huge part of the fun in the game. So modifiers, just to give you a sense of what it is that you should try to achieve as you're setting up an attack or preparing to defend, uh, there are 
advantages, the, the modifiers that apply during the artillery fire and modifiers that apply during the ground fire. Um, and here are the modifiers, armor, crossing, a river, so this uh, river assault, using a close air support, mission, disorder, or unsupply, that's always bad. True quality modifier, you look at this table here, cross-referencing the quality of the of the targeted point unit and the firing unit or asset and you get the modifier again elite versus elite gets nothing and elite versus veteran versus green of course gets a bonus and the opposite is true you have negative uh, things when you have a green unit going to fight in any case when you're firing against a more experienced unit you get negative modifiers Terrain modifier, so that is the terrain defensive number, depending on where the combat is taking place. Uh, but that, of course, only is is advantageous for the defender. The um, modifiers that may be based on the target point unit, targeted units that have a river assault marker, if all units of the attacker i have this marker because they are because they're crossing a river when attacking strong points uh strong points the israeli player has strong points which are very good at absorbing hits they don't fire all that much they're not that strong when attacking but they're really good defenses and then there are special rules for the one night turn there's only one night turn in the game guess what you roll dice you apply modifiers it's uh, five or more after modifiers have been applied is a hit and hit priorities again more flavor more more chrome here more daunting details for the new player more fun to be had once you become familiar with the procedures and again these players are just so good so well done when you're attacking uh, the attacker, when you're inflicting hits on the attacker, this is the priority, the order in which they must be applied. And when you're inflicting hits on the defender, this is it. One very important thing, the first hit is a mandatory step loss against an asset or the point unit. After the first hit has been has been inflicted, the attacker may choose to abort attack. Then everybody in the attacking force becomes disordered, but then the attacker is over. Otherwise, you can choose to simply um, take the remaining hits and then as the attacker, you'll finally get to fire in ground combat. Remember, uh, the defender fires first, the attacker has to go through this um, path of pain and then the attacker, if the attacker has an aborted combat, gets to, uh, to fire against the defender and then the defender has to go through this other series of painful situations. But the defender has better ways of trying to avoid taking hits. For example, the defender may have field works that can be removed before a unit takes a hit. You may avoid a hit of artillery fire by disordering your units. You may avoid a hit of ground fire by retreating and additional hits uh, those you have to take there are only so many things you can do to dodge bullets and to well to dodge hits this is another solid release by gmt and another solid chapter in the fast action battle system i wasn't sure how the system would work in a recent post world war ii uh, situation but it works very well and probably this is due to the enormous flexibility the enormous flexibility given by the assets. The assets are probably one of the best things in the game, well, there are a lot of other good things. I like block games in general, I like the quality of the troop, the shifts as the action uh, progresses, I like them very much. But the assets really are what makes this game different from so many other systems. Um, but that also means that the the entry level, the, the, the entry test to be admitted to playing the game is a little tough because because you have to remember a lot of specific effects. You have the, the manual, which is divided in two areas, in two sections. One is the general system, which is something like 10 pages, it's very simple. 
It's very uh, intuitive also. And then you'll have pretty much as many pages with specific rules uh, that apply to this game. And a lot of those have to, do, um, have to do with assets and what they do specifically and how they interact with one another. Uh, there are things that are simpler here than in previous games. For example, here you do not have dogfights uh, if both players commit air resources, but you have actually that you may have interactions between the uh, the air defenses of the Syrian player and the air capabilities of the of the Israeli player. So there are still complexities, there are still interactions, you may still have to go through like a mini combat to see if the aircraft of the Israeli player are um, are diverted or destroyed by the defense of the Syrian player. But it's just a matter of habit, it's just a matter of getting used to the system. One, you do get to learn what the assets do, there is great advantage in the flexibility that you have from the assets. A lot of, of strategy comes from committing them at the right time, figuring out when it is the right time to concentrate them, uh, setting up a situation that allows you to concentrate assets because you need to meet certain requirements to be able to commit more assets than the basic number. Uh, so there are a lot, there's a lot of strategy that goes around that, around those assets. They definitely are, I wouldn't say the protagonist, but I would say the co-protagonist of the story. The units are still very important, but the co-protagonist of the story and so it's a cloud of factors that surrounds the action that is carried over by the units and that really adds a lot of chrome flavor and interesting decisions to the game. Uh, as for the overall action, the architecture of the game, uh, well, you saw the map, it's not that big, it doesn't have so many areas, and it doesn't have um, so, so much flexibility. There's two sides pushing in opposite directions. It's, uh, and I wouldn't say that this, you know, like, is, is an ancient phalanx, but definitely uh, you have a little bit of the sense pushing one direction, pushing another one. Um, and, the, and But that, that is good also because uh, it, you, do, during the game the Syrian player clearly is the attacker and the Syrian player needs to get as much momentum as possible to punch through the defenses of the opponent before the opponent is able to build a critical mass on reinforcements and to push back. So you definitely have this dynamic which is attacker and then during the the course of the game the attacker the attacker defender dichotomy is switched and the two sides get to have different roles um but i definitely like the pressure and the tension that is created by uh, the fact that cm play just throwing uh, attacks one after the other and trying to gain momentum and just inflict as much damage as possible. And yet there is always there is always something in the way of the Syrian play that almost looks like, oh, I could do it next turn. Something always happens. Yes, it is an asset. Yes, it is an enforcement. It is a darn wadi board. It is a darn escarpment. The terrain is pretty. It's a darn minefield. You need to take a morale check. You do not know whether or not your units will go through the minefield or will say like, eh, no thanks, you're going this other way. But that other way takes too long to get where you need to go. So the terrain is pretty challenging. It's pretty challenging. Um, more, I feel more than it was in other, in other titles in the series, uh, which also means more types of borders that you have to memorize to learn uh, to learn what they do, and then you have to learn how to use them and how to prevent them from uh, getting you stuck where you do not want to get stuck. In any case, the interaction of terrain and units, uh, the interaction of units and assets, uh, the fact that the roles of attacker and defender can change out the game, give variety and flavor um, to a game that, if you look at the, at the map, may feel a little, cons may feel a little um, claustrophobic, may feel a little limited, but it isn't because there are a lot of subtleties that go, um, that happen around this apparently simple idea, push one way and the opponent tries to push in the opposite direction, the end is not that. In the macro sense it is, but the the, the many actions that result in that macro action are interesting in their own and they have a lot of interesting game um, game elements around that, game decisions and some really nice intense moments like you often have when you have this bucket of dice uh, combat system. It's always fun to roll the, the, the proverbial bucket of dice 
be, uh, the results can be not completely random, but there is a certain variety there. You have some murder attacks, you have some completely uh, useless attacks where you had piled up a lot of assets, and if you roll once everywhere, then that's it. So yes, there is a luck element, but again, uh, I, it works well to me. In war games, I want that luck element. I actually want some WTF moments uh, that I did not expect because they add variety uh, to the game, they add fun, eh, but if they don't get to the point where they make the game feel completely random, they're welcome, they're not a problem for me. Also, not a game that has as many units as other games in the series, so it doesn't uh, take too long to play, it's pretty manageable. Uh, definitely, I only have really good things to say about this game. The presentation is very good, uh, very pleasant components, very nice, high quality. So, Golan 73, definitely a solid game, I like it. Also, it's about a topic that I do not encounter very often in war games, so uh, that is another plus for me. I recommend it to fan of the of the fast action battle system. If you like the system, this is a no-brainer because you're gonna enjoy this one. For players that have never tried the system, this is the best title to start. Maybe, maybe yes. This one or Sicily. I may still prefer Sicily a tad little bit more just because the map is more interesting and results in in a more dynamic, organic uh, overall action. But this one is very solid. I, I'd be torn mm, if you haven't tried the system in recommending one over the other I would the complexity seems to be more or less the same I would say go with the theme if Sicily or Golan interest one of them interests you more than the other well then go with that one the Balge is probably the less strong title in the trilogy so you can play that later um, if you enjoyed the system in any case Golan 73 fun and solid work game by GMT a new game in the fast action battle system